Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Hello and welcome friends to this third and concluding lecture on uh, power. Today we will be focusing on uh, this connection between power and knowledge where we will be using Foucauldian conception of power and we will see how his conception of power is a kind of radical departure from the usual commonsensical and in ordinary sense of the term when we use uh, power as a domination of one over the other. And uh, in that uh, conception of power, we will also see how for Foucault, power is not merely a kind of uh, negative or a kind of uh, suppressive thing, but it also enables, it is also a productive thing uh, for the individual and society. So, this conception we will uh, study and discuss through. Foucauldian conception of power. Then we will discuss some other conception of power like feminist conception, Marxist conception and also pluralist notion of power. Then we will conclude this uh, lectures on power. So, to understand this uh, idea of this radical conception of power, it is necessary to understand this relationship between power and knowledge. Now, this relationship is very unique. And many scholars have argued and some of you may also be familiar with uh, this idea that knowledge is power. So, if you are knowledgeable about something that knowledge empower you or gives you power to do something about that knowledge. So, knowledge here is understood as a kind of enabling thing for an individual about doing something or to um, use that knowledge for certain purposes for society, for self or for humanity and so on. So, knowledge is seen as power. So, Francis Bacon, the knowledge is power is something which is very crucial to understand. So, this relationship between knowledge and power, uh, we uh, conventionally or in ordinary sense understand knowledge as enabling power. It gives power to the person who holds knowledge about something. Now, in Foucault, we will see the kind of departure from this relationship between knowledge and power, where how certain forms of knowledge is regarded as knowledge in the first place is the exercise of power. So, for example, say in modern times, uh, the healing exercise. So, we have many methods of healing like Ayurvedic, Unani, allopathic and so on. Now, why allopathic is regarded as the uh, solution for the medical problems in modern times? Precisely because in the modern times, the power structure uh, and its hierarchy creates a condition where medical knowledge, especially the allopathic is regarded as the most authoritative, most acceptable forms of healing and therefore, the other modes of healing is regarded in that hierarchy. Not uh, really effective or not as effective a knowledge um, in modern times. So, but at one point of time, these other modes of healing were also regarded as effective modes of healing. So, in India, in many um, parts, there is a still a struggle to assert those modes of healing. So, the point I am trying to make here is that how knowledge is regarded as knowledge is itself the uh, creation of power structure. And that is what Foucault contributes to this relationship between knowledge and power. So, in this relationship, this radical view about this relationship is put forward by Michel Foucault. 
and he emphasized upon a different aspect of power as productive. So, usually we see power as a kind of repressive, power suppress something. But in Foucauldian understanding, we will find he see power not merely as a negative phenomena or a kind of suppressive thing, but it also has some productive elements to it. So, the ordinary understanding of power as coercion, repression or subjugation, Foucault moves beyond that. The term power is productive explains the subtle nature of power. So, the way power functions or operates is not in, some, in terms of actual domination or subordination. Power in Foucauldian sense is invisible, but it is always there, it flows through the system. When domination, subordination or contestation or resistance to the exercise of power happens that shows the effect of power. So, there is nothing without the exercise of power in that sense. So, the term power is uh, productive explains those subtle or the uh, nuance or the invisible uh, pervasiveness of power throughout the system where domination, subordination and resistance to such domination and subordination occurs. So, knowledge of individuals or subjects is integrally related or linked to the power or effects of power. So, in one of our topics on governmentality, when we will discuss state, we will come again to this point of how state use knowledge or the knowledge of the subjects or the citizens as a tool for governmentality. Is you know here the knowledge is also used as a tool for the exercise of power. So, knowing the subject to make one's populations visible or uh, the uh, administration aware of the uh, population and its characteristics helps the state to exercise its power more effectively. So, knowledge in that sense is helpful for the exercise of uh, power. So, it generates an integral relationship between power and knowledge where the uh, relationship between power is not really one supporting the other, but it is a kind of interdependent where uh, how knowledge is regarded as a knowledge is itself the uh, outcome of the structure of power, but knowledge as a tool also enables the agent or the institution or the state to exercise its power more effectively in the society. It defines how both knowledge and power works simultaneously and not independently. So, the exercise of uh, knowledge and power is a kind of simultaneously and not uh, separately. So, in Foucauldian understanding this relationship is not of one enabling the other, but how it simultaneously create the effects of power where uh, power and its exercise becomes more effectively in terms of controlling, in terms of governing the population, society or individual. Now, the Foucauldian understanding of knowledge power relations point out to new ways of observing human beings in a society. So, through this uh, interconnection between knowledge and power, it enables the state and its institution to see the individual in the society in a new way. So, for him power is not always then repressive or brute or punishes people, but exercise of power is more about techniques or use of techniques like surveillance or gaze to gather knowledge about the subject people and to make the effect of power that is realized over the docile subject bodies. So, uh, the exercise of power is not just a kind of repressive brute exercise, but it uses the techniques such as surveillance. So, uh, in prison, if you uh, know the way uh, the inmates are uh, controlled or uh, governed or managed is something the exercise of this constant supervision or surveillance over them. Similarly, any state while governing or controlling the population uses certain techniques of power. And that techniques of power is not just about merely brute or suppressive exercise of power, but it is something where the role of knowledge, techniques 
or uh, the modes of such techni techniques like surveillance and uh, gaze enables the state to gather knowledge about the subject and then that knowledge enables that institution to govern and control them in a more effective manner. So, here again the relationship between power knowledge is reflected through the use of techniques like surveillance to gain knowledge or to know about how people works or how they behave and how the self reacts under effects of disciplinary power. So, the power of a state is more kind of disciplining the body without directly physically in the brute manner forcing or repressing someone to do something. So, uh, in modern times and more on this we will discuss when we will discuss governmentality, when uh, governmental power is more effective when government is not physically available. So, it creates a conditions or a structures or which conditions the individual to act, behave and express in a certain ways and that invisibility of government is a reflection of its most effective use of power through the techniques of uh, governmentality or disciplinary power. So, uh, power not only restraints or constraints but in most ways power produce something called knowledge and knowledge is an exercise of power and power is a function of knowledge. So, there is a kind of again inter relationship between these two phenomena which we call knowledge and power. So, it is not as if it functions independently from each other, but it is a kind of interdependent phenomena. Now, Foucault in order to understand the relationship between power and knowledge also emphasized on subjugated knowledge. So, how the knowledge or what we term as knowledge is the exercise of power or to understand this relationship between or interrelationship rather between knowledge and power, he uh, tried to argue it through this idea of subjugated knowledge. Now, he made a distinction between subjugated knowledge or disqualified knowledge and knowledge which is imposed by an order based on scientific significance or having scientific hierarchism of our local knowledge. So, in a society you have different uh, modes of knowledge, different kinds of knowledge. Why in modern society for example, only the scientific education or the technological education is regarded as superior to the uh, traditional or conventional knowledge. Now, at one point of time those traditional knowledge or conventional laws may be useful or relevant and those are still relevant for many people and communities today. But in this hierarchy of knowledge in modern times, the scientific and technological education is regarded far more superior to the conventional or uh, traditional knowledge. Here, the traditional or uh, conventional knowledge or local knowledge is regarded far more inferior or in a kind of subjugated knowledge than say modern scientific and technological knowledge. So, for him subjugated knowledge is understood as a set of disqualified or local or believed to be inadequate or insufficient knowledge which is considered inferior to the knowledge derived from science or under scientific hierarchism. So, these are the forms of subjugated knowledge which is understood as a disqualified local or believed to be inadequate or insufficient knowledge in uh, comparison to the knowledge that is derived from science or under scientific hierarchism. So, some of the disqualified or subjugated knowledge that Foucault talked about uh, where psychiatric patients, ill persons of the nurse or doctors and knowledge about the medicine. So, he talks about a lot of forms of subjugated knowledge and that reflects the constant uh, power struggle in terms of uh, creating or positioning one form of knowledge as superior scientific hence acceptable and other forms of knowledge as inferior traditional conventional or insufficient inadequate knowledge. So, he argued that the re-emergence of such disqualified or subjugated knowledge makes us realize that historical struggle. So, this point is very crucial to understand how a particular forms of knowledge becomes a 
authoritative forms of knowledge or superior forms of knowledge that is about the historical struggles or conflicts of opinion took place between hierarchy of knowledge available on grounds of its having scientific validity or not. So, here the basic argument about the knowledge and power and the hierarchy of knowledge is that nothing which we uh, take as for granted or which we assume as a superior it was not superior or it has not been superior uh, throughout the history. There have been a constant struggle or conflicts of opinion about a particular knowledge or forms of knowledge whether it is superior or not. This idea of scientificism or rationality and other things which comes much later, but this struggle over what constitute knowledge and what is not which form of or what method of knowledge or inquiry can be regarded as uh, superior or not. So, in modern times a lot of things you may uh, happen for example, I give this example that um, uh, a form of knowledge is most scientific which is based on the experiment and that experiment legitimizes that knowledge. That means, any person in any lab sitting across the globe involved in the same experiment should arrive at the same result. Only that form of knowledge is considered as most scientific or acceptable form of knowledge. However, human being also have other modes of knowing for example, intuitions or guts feeling and so on. Now, those modes of knowing through your guts feeling, so which you know, but you cannot experiment, you cannot explain scientifically should that form of knowledge regarded as inferior in this hierarchy of knowledge. So, those are the questions which uh, leads us to understand the making of any knowledge as superior or inferior is part of the historical struggle where the scientificism, rationality and methods of inquiry becomes merely as a tool for establishing some modes of knowledge as superior and delegitimizing or disqualifying other modes of knowledge. So, the structure of power and knowledge is in constant interrelationship in creating this power structure or hierarchy of knowledge. So, the re-emergence of such kinds of local or disqualified or subjugated knowledge also provides perhaps a scope to critique knowledge or to argue or find out the difference existed or existing between different kinds of knowledge. So, it happens in the contemporary times also. So, when uh, the authority of allopathy as a modes of healing is widely acceptable, however, there are constant challenge or criticism to this modes of healing by the practitioner of say Yunani or homeopathy or Ayurvedic medicine and so on. So, thus in Foucauldian perspective, we find power is understood as productive it produces newer identities and subjectivity. So, we may assume I will discuss this point again when I will discuss the next sentence that is uh, in his definition of power it is more like a capillary flowing throughout the system like blood in the capillaries of our bodies. So, this is the most radical comprehensive understanding of power which believes power is not just domination, it is not just subordination, it is not the physical or the brute force of one over the other, but it is seen as the productive and how productive I will discuss, but uh, the circulation of power in the system is like capillary in the veins, the blood uh, uh, which flows through our capillary throughout our bodies. Similarly, power circulates throughout the system. When we see the instances of say domination or subordination or resistances to such dominations and subordination, those are the effect or the particular instances of power, but power is always already flowing throughout the system. So, it flows through this uh, between a doctor and the patient, teacher and the pupil, the superior uh, officials or the subordinate officials. So, those circulation of power is already always present. When a superior or a teacher or a medical practitioner uses that power, that is the particular instance or effect of power, not really the 
power feature. So, the both here the teacher or the pupil, subordinate or the superior, doctor and the patient are the subject of power, the power over whom it is exercised and the one who is exercising the power both are here the subject of this uh, um, circulation of power throughout the system. Now, in this definition of power, you may find this uh, definition similar to say Talcott persons, idea of power as money functions in the economy or for example, Hannah Arendt idea of power too, it is a kind of uh, positive power. However, in Foucault, we have very radical and most comprehensive account of power so far, where the exercise of power in terms of controlling or discipline really its effect. Power is already present and flow through the system which produces newer identities and subjectivities through the techniques of governmentality. Now, there may be a kind of misconception when uh, you uh, get to know that power is like all pervasive uh, phenomena, then what is the scope of any alternative or newer identities or um, subjectivities that can be produced. This is precisely the point which Foucault is trying to argue that power is not just about suppression, but it also has enabling capacity. So, human subjectivities when is conditioned by the structure of power that is in operation, it also gives him or her the opportunity to resist those power, to resist such domination and that resistance is again coming from the same structure of power, but enables or creates the possibilities of creation of newer identities or newer subjectivities. So, um, it is not like that power when understood as uh, all pervasive closes any possibilities or restrain or limits any alternative imagination of identities or subjectivities. In fact, power is like enabling thing where individual can create newer identities and newer subjectivities and not just become merely the subject or the victim of power. So, now uh, that is uh, the conception of power by Foucault, which we have seen through this uh, dichotomy between uh, knowledge and power. Next is the feminist conception of power, where the focus is the basic idea that how the structure of uh, society or family or the state, which claims to be neutral, makes this um, suppression or a discrimination of women almost invisible in its discourse. So, the focus of feminist writings or feminist scholarship is how power relationship operates in the society, which makes uh, half of the population um, vulnerable or uh, discriminate them against the other half of the population. So, how this subjugation of women or suppression of women is ensured through these particular modes of uh, power, which radical feminist argue as the patriarchy. So, these uh, structure of power which we will discuss. So, feminist questions first, uh, the women's systemic structural and the unequal access to power. So, feminists believe that the system of patriarchy and which we will discuss what is this patriarchy, subjugates or dominates and deprived women of resources and equality. So, it started from right from the family and not necessarily in the society or in the state. So, what happens to women in the society and state is the extension of domination and discrimination that women faces in the family. So, the real power struggle or real justice or quest for justice start with the family where men and women should be treated equally, they should be given equal opportunities. Uh, right from the family to the society to the state and therefore, they do not just um, uh, talk about discrimination in the society or state, but also in the family and the patriarchy therefore, is that structure of power which subjugates, which justify the subjugation and discrimination of uh, women and put them in the inferior condition and so on. So, patriarchy as a system of domination operates at different levels in society, economy, political and cultural and so on 
and at the same time it overlaps with other system of power also. For example, the idea of race, class, caste which also divides the population on the issue of race or class or caste. Now, sometimes the structure of patriarchy overlaps with these structure of power that is based on class, race or caste. For instance, a Dalit or a lower caste woman is affected differently under system of patriarchy in India than a white upper caste woman. So, their oppression or subjugation is not equal. So, that shows the intersectionality in terms of how power structure often come together to uh, treat a particular subject in a different way depending upon his or her social historical status. But oppression or subjugation of women exist in different uh, setups across the globe. Now, in the context of India, I have given the example similarly between black and white women, although they both are women face different kind of subjugation or discrimination. So, uh, we have different uh, kind of feminists. So, liberal feminist particularly highlights the shortcomings of concepts of liberty, equality, rights and justice that fails to pay attention to the women or gender issue prevalent in society. So, they argue for equality said, such as that power should be equally distributed among men and women, so that women too enjoy equal power like men in society and can live with dignity, respect and identity of her own and so on. So, um, uh, these are the arguments of liberal feminist. Thus, they focus on say equal pay for equal work, equal rights, equal um, uh, freedom and justice like their male counterparts to address gender based discriminations and inequality in society. So, the liberal feminist will argue about equality, uh, freedom and justice for women like their male counterparts to address the gender discrimination in the society. So, the Marxist explanation of politics is based on this idea of class, there they are almost blind to the other kind of discrimination based on gender or caste. So, Marxist feminist will argue about the gender blindness of the class analysis and in the analysis of gender just society, radical feminist further questions the very basic division of society on gender basis. So, this idea many of you may be familiar with this difference between sex and gender. Now, this discrimination or difference that is based on sex is biological right and the gender is something which is socially and culturally constructed. So, what uh, a particular gender and what role a particular gender should perform it is not biological it is socially and culturally constructed. Now, the radical feminist will go one step ahead then the Marxist or the liberal feminist to argue about this basic division of society on gender basis and they emphasize on the rule of patriarchy which is the root of all uh, discrimination against women in the society, state and in the family. So, they emphasize on uh, patriarchy as the major reasons for subjugated positions of women in the society. So, for feminists gender is the prime category of social and political analysis. So, they look at the gender and through gender lens they study the power structure in the society, in the family and in the state. However, there are significant differences between the families. So, as I have uh, discussed with you the differences between liberal feminist or Marxist feminist or radical feminist is significant. And within that, there is also other kinds of families, say Dalit feminist, black feminist and so on and so forth. So, for instance, a liberal feminist will differ from Marxist and radical feminist will differ from both or vice versa. So, there are rich differences and debates within feminism. However, the common agenda that unites them is making a society more just by ensuring equal opportunities for the women. Now, in feminist uh, contribution to uh, social science or philosophy of uh, knowledge and science is that it opens up new kind of debates about thinking 
about uh, a just society or a more equal society. So the point is for a very long time there was a kind of uh, assumption that a state really do not discriminate between men and women because it is a neutral agent or so is the society. But here feminist scholarship questions such kind of assumptions and establishes how the gender discriminations or gender based discriminations are made invisible by this assumption of state neutrality or neutrality of the society and so on which makes the discrimination or injustices that is meted out to women invisible and the relationship therefore between men and women is not that of equality but is hierarchical one exercising his power over the other. Now another point that we need to focus is that according to the feminist how a woman is treated by a man is not result of the bad behavior or the bad manners of that particular individual, but it is systemic, it is structural that means women faces discrimination or subjugation or oppression in different forms, in different situations historically across the society. Their degree may vary as I have said about the Dalit women or the upper caste women or the white women or the black women and so on. But nonetheless, they all face such discrimination and that unites them on this question of gender and they see power operation through the gender lens. Now the next is the Marxist conception of power which talks about the idea of exploitation. So Marxist conception of power basically emphasizes upon the exploitative nature of power where it enables one section of the society to extract surplus from the other section of society and uh, that gives uh, a kind of uh, tool in the hands of a powerful to exploit those who are vulnerable or those who are in the condition of marginality or vulnerability. So in the Marxist conception of power it is seen as a kind of exploitative and it is seen as coercive tool to exploit the laborers or the weaker section in the society particularly. So Marxist theory of power pointed out specifically to a particular type of capitalist mode of production controlled by an economically dominant class. So those who exercise domination economically, they also get to exercise uh, domination politically, socially, culturally and so on. So in Marxist analysis, a state in a capitalist society is constitutive of two classes, basically the bourgeoisie which owns the modes of production and the proletariat whose life and very survival is dependent on that modes without owning that uh, modes of production. So their relationships are determined by their relationship to the means of production. So if uh, a person owns that means of production that is the bourgeoisie or the capitalist, capitalist class and the one who is subjected to or whose very survival is dependent on that means of production without owning them is the proletariat and they are in the large number and they are always in the minority. So we are not going into the details but the very relationship between the two is determined by their relationship to the means of production. So if that is a society that is a capitalist society, the nature of a state in such a society is that it work on behest of or on behalf of the dominant capitalist classes and it is often portrayed as the instrument in the hands of the dominant classes. So a state in a capitalist society works on behalf of bourgeoisie or the capitalist and it protects the interest of the bourgeoisie and therefore in the Marxist writing you may say that uh, you may find that many Marxists argued about the withering away of the state. So there is no need of a state because a state is the instrument of class exploit, exploitation. So uh, it argues that the legal and the political equality and freedom in the absence of real social and economic freedom to everyone is hollow and makes very little sense to a large number of population. Hence it argues for social and economic freedom and equality. So in the Marxist conception the uh, idea of uh, power is basically about exploitative in nature which ensures the uh, domination of one class over the other where state also functions like an instrument in the hands of dominant classes. So in the Marxist analysis it is said that a state is there to manage the common affair of all bourgeoisie. 
and uh, facilitates the exploitation of the proletariat or those who do not own the property or means of production. Um, uh, their exploitation is um, facilitated by the state on behalf of or for the benefit of bourgeoisie. So, that is about the capitalist mode of economy and how power operates there according to the Marxist conception of power. Now, pluralist conception of power emphasizes on the point that power is exercised by different political groups. So, in the pluralist conception of power, there is no single small group of people in a society which exercise power. It is largely exercised by different groups, different individuals and so on. So, various political groups participate in the decision making process or influence important policies of the state. So, power is not something which is in the hands of single or the small group of people, but there are different groups, different actors, different institutions which exercises the power. So, they all participate in the decision making processes or influence the important policies of the state. So, power really do not resides in one person or a group of person or a very uh, few institution. It is like more plural uh, in terms of its exercise or in terms of those who yields power or holds power. So, thus it questions the view that any one person or group uphold or exercise political or economic power in society. Unlike the sociological account of power which emphasizes on the centralization of power, the pluralists argue about decentralization of power in decision making process. So, the uh, best example is a vibrant democracy. So, power as it operates leads to centralization, but the democracy as a system of rule or governance focuses not on one person, one party, one group and so on, but it gives a scope for other groups, other parties and other individual. So, uh, this uh, leads to a more uh, decentralization of power away from the uh, sociological understanding or emphasis of power which talks about the centralization of power in the society in the hands of single or small groups. So, in contrast to pluralist understanding of power, C. Wright Mills in his work The Power Elites rejects the view that USA enjoys separation of power or it enjoys decentralization of power. So, he argues basically that it is in the hands of elite where power resides and in turn elites enjoy the power, but large section of the society is always the subject. Uh, to that power which is exercised by the elites and power rotates among the elites and not really among the masses. So, there are other criticisms to pluralist conception of power. It is uh, argued that it focuses only on the behavioralist approach how power actually functions and not really the wider dimensions of um, or uh, the inherent uh, pervasive of power even when many others are involved who actually controls the decision making. So, P. Bakrak and M. Barge questions the pluralists about the organized political agenda where some of the important socio-political issues gets unobservable or invisible such as race and minority interest issues. So, in this approach the uh, forms of discriminations or subjugations may never be uh, made visible or observable, because they uh, do not see the hidden structure of power which puts a particular community or a group of people in the condition of subordination. So, they also criticize the pluralist for not directly focusing on the power relationship as existing in a society which proliferates in terms of domination and subjugation of various classes in the society. So, in uh, the pluralist approach, they may see the visible uh, participation or a plur, uh, exercise of power, but power by its very nature also have some uh, hidden or some invisible characteristics where it puts some individual or some groups precisely because of certain decisions, certain policies and so on in the condition of subordination and pluralists fail to understand those 
conditions of uh, dominations and subjugations of various classes in the society. Now, in these three lectures, we have seen different uh, conceptualization of power and we have studied its relationship between authority and legitimacy. Now, power remains one of uh, the central, uh, but uh, most complex and essentially contested concept in political theory. And this we have discussed through different scholars and different uh, perspectives and their approach to power. So, it reflects the contested nature of uh, such conceptualization. However, it is central in the organization of modern state and politics. So, you cannot think about and argue about politics in any society or state without referring to power. So, the power remains the central category in any discourse on modern society or modern polity. However, it is often not that visible or expressed. So, through many examples we have seen that the way power is understood in the common sensical ordinary sense as suppression or the brute force or the domination is not really uh, the um, adequate understanding of way power operates. So, for right from the Stephen Luke's three stages of power or three dimensional view of power to Talcott persons to um, Gramsci and then Foucault, we have seen how power is most effective. Where its operation is made almost invisible. So, the uh, comprehensive or the most adequate understanding is to understand the functioning or the operation of power where there is no direct or uh, visible agent involving in its exercise, where everybody feels that everything is fine and they are doing for uh, some great thing and yet they are subject to a particular ideology or a particular power structure. So, power in that sense is most effective when its use or its exercise is made invisible. So, um, we have to uh, finally, uh, remember both its negative as well as the positive dimension of power. So, a power when it operates or it creates a structure of uh, domination and subordination, it does not only have the negative role, but it also has the uh, positive dimensions where it enables want to do something, to become something and provide them the opportunities and a scope to produce newer subjectivities and newer identities. For example, I am giving you this hypothetical examples. For a very long time, Indians were ruled by the British rule and generation after generation, they believed that British rule will be there and that is their fate, then they should abide by or subject themselves to uh, the British rule. But uh, gradually, they in the same power structure, they realize, uh, they mobilized and formed and created a newer subjectivities which give them the confidence to fight against the British. Now, how you understand uh, that situation if it is just power is just about domination and subordination, but power also has the productive or the positive dimension where it enables the subject of its power to create newer subjectivities and newer identities which we must also take into account when we discuss and debate about the power. It is not merely about domination and suppression. Now, to conclude this lecture, you can refer to some of these uh, writings like Norman uh, Barry, an introduction to modern uh, political theory and then Rajiv Bhargav and Ashok Acharya, there is a chapter by Menon on um, political theory and introduction on power. Michel Foucault, you can read from Power and Knowledge, that is the selected interviews and other writings. So, this is very um, original uh, text on uh, Foucauldian conception of power and the relationship between power and knowledge. And from Rod Deborah, you can uh, study feminism and the state. So, these are some of the readings for this lecture today. And with that, we conclude uh, this lecture on power. In the next lecture, we will take up new uh, topic that is on state and sovereignty. So, uh, please write to us what you feel about um, uh, this lecture and also uh, write your queries, we will be happy to respond. Thank you for listening, thank you all.